Good evening. We'd like to welcome you all to ASHRAE's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Radiation Oncology Social Education Series. I'm Bill Small, and I'll be your host for the session on Recruitment in Radiation Oncology. Dell and Roll is a new social education series that focuses on diversity, equity, and belonging in radiation oncology, brought to you by the newly formed ASHRAE ex officio Council on Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, CHETI, and the Division of Education. The series focuses on conversations with our members, residents, students, patient community. You also hear from leaders in various specialties and industries on several topics related to DEI and belonging. The Delano program is designed for us to share our experiences, research, ask questions, and openly discuss fundamental core concept and structural issues within medicine and radiation oncology. Our hope is that great work and understanding starts with open dialogue. We hope that we will inspire change and that you are encouraged to share your experiences with us and engage in the session. You are able to do that by chatting in the fields, belonging or tweeting using the hashtag pound Delinro, D-L-I-N-R-O. Um, first of all, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Bill Small. I'm chair of radiation oncology and the uh, cancer center director at Loyola University in Chicago. I spent a considerable amount of time before I moved to this institution at Northwestern. Um, I've had a very long interest in this subject and being the cancer center director of a Jesuit institution that really prides itself in social justice and equity. It is one of my passions that our institution be a leader in that. Um, we are really trying very hard to do that. And I'm excited and thankful that Ashley gave me this opportunity. And before we start the dialogue, I'm just gonna ask some of my uh, fellow colleagues to kind of introduce themselves. I'll start with Dr. Shauna Campbell. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Shana Campbell. I am here today because I was the chair of ARO, which is the Association for Residents in Radiation Oncology. Um, I served in that role from 2020 to 2021, and I now serve as the past chair. Um, I also serve as a resident advocate with other organizations such as the ABR and the ROI. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from Cleveland Clinic uh, Radiation Oncology Residency, and I'm actually going to be joining as faculty there in August after my brief break. Uh, I'll be specializing in head and neck and sarcoma treatment, but I also really plan to continue focusing on graduate medical education, staying involved with ASTRO to sort of help with our recruitment in radiation oncology. So I'm grateful to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, Shauna. Uh, Dr. Rachel Jimenez. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Jimenez. I'm a breast radiation oncologist at Mass General Hospital. Um, I'm the associate program director for the Harvard Radiation Oncology Program a faculty advisor for the Aero Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee and the vice president of the Association for Program Directors in Radiation Oncology. Uh, so my research and clinical interests have focused in breast cancer as well as in radiation oncology education um, with a particular interest in issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I also serve on the Astro Ethics Committee. So my interests in diversity, equity, inclusion have an ethical bent as well. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to take part in the conversation today. Thanks, Rachel. I should probably also mention I am the Asher Education Committee Chair and have done some other stuff, which makes me want to do this even more. Um, and le last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Kurt DeVille will um, introduce himself and also give some background on what the issues are in our specialty. And just a, a few slides. This isn't meant to be a PowerPoint conversation, but just a few slides. Kurt? Yep. Thanks, Bill. And i um, really happy to be part of this conversation today and uh, with some distinguished colleagues as well. And hopefully um, we'll have opportunity for good discussion and, and folks who are listening in, please feel free to share your comments and experience as we go along. Uh, my name is Kirtland DeVille. I'm an associate professor of radiation oncology at Johns Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine. I'm uh, the medical director of their proton therapy center based in Washington, D.C and my clinical and research interests are in GU, mostly prostate cancer and actually soft tissue sarcoma as well. Um, but uh, along the way, much as uh, many others have already described, I've been very passionate about um, uh, workforce diversity and have carved out as a research um, interest looking at workforce trends um, in mostly racial, ethnic, and gender diversity, just because that's where um, the publicly available data um, exists although there's certainly effort um, to collect, you know, broadening, broadening the scope of diversity and really uh, assessing and collecting um, data for various groups, expanding beyond just race, ethnicity, and gender, um, such as sexual gender minorities, um, kind of abled and disabled populations, um, uh, and 
many others that we could uh, list, disadvantaged groups, first generation, et cetera. Um, and so I should also mention, I ser have served with ASTRO um, as a volunteer, actually dating back to when I was a resident and joined what was uh, before uh, not known as the um, Committee on Health, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, but has evolved over time to a committee and now um, the Ex officio um, Council on Health, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, which would be up for a member vote at the annual meeting this October to officially become a council um, for ASHO. So we're really excited and hoping that everyone can support and, and get out to the, to the vote when the time um, comes. Um, and I'm happy to talk about some of the ASHO's efforts and initiatives in this phase. And can also mention I've worked with um, both ASCO and the ACR on, um, on their um, diversity health equity um, committees and mainly focus on pipeline programs and enrichment programs for underrepresented minorities. So happy to, to touch on that as well. Um, but I wanted, so I was going to kind of lead off with some data and just presenting some data, what's going on in radiation oncology to kind of set the scene um, for our conversation here. Um, we, a few years ago, published an analysis looking um, at 2015, in 2015, this is some updated data uh, from 2019, a similar analysis looking at the spread of the largest kind of 20 to 23 training specialties, uh, residency training specialties that you can go in directly from medical school um, into these training programs, um, and seeing how we are doing relative to these other specialties. And um, it become very clear to us over time that we're not doing as well as, as uh, some of our colleagues in other specialties when we look at gender specifically for women. Um, you can see that um, the kind of total pool, what's listed there, 45.8% you know, um, is, is the total graduate medical education pool of residents um, and trainees. And radiation oncology is toward you know, the, the lower end there in representation at 30% really has been hovering around 25 to 30% uh, percent over time. And you can see, you know, there um, it, there's a some interesting, um, sometimes we assume or we know some of the specialties, OBGYN being an obvious one that has increased a lot of um, uh, female representation. Um, but we can see that we're not doing, you know, as well as colleagues in many other specialties, you know, such as general surgery, pathology, um, even ENT. And so, um, you know, it's, 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 it's unclear, at, at least to me, um, why we would not be doing as well as other specialties and taking advantage of the pool of available uh, women that are coming out of medical school and going into training. Um, and so in the next slide, we'll see that this uh, trend has essentially continued over time. Um, and this was a paper published in the Red Journal a few years ago that um, it did with uh, um, uh, Awad Ahmed, who, while he was a trainee, a re resident in radiation oncology um, at the University of Miami and now is out in training in, in Seattle. But um, we, we compared the, um, our HEMONC trainee um, colleagues and faculty to RADONC, and it's a little bit busy, but I think you can see there in the red line, so that's our colleagues in HEMONC. Um, the, the top line is the residents and then the faculty there's about a, there's a consistent trend that works out to about a percentage point per year over the past you know nearly 30 years um, with women reaching near parity in training and, and soon in their faculty numbers but you can see while the trend lines are up for, for the corresponding lines in radiation oncology those blue lines for both uh, trainees and faculty the trend is much much uh, slower and you know it's sort of averaged out to 0.3 percent per year um, and, and when we calculated it out, it would take about 50 years for radiation oncology to re reach parity and gender uh, parity representation if it continued at that pace. So obviously we don't, we don't want to continue at that pace. We want to see that change, but you can see there's a little bit of a downward trend there at the end. And so we're, we're really not moving the bar making significant changes, at least as well as, as hopefully we, we can and should um, in the future. Um, and then so in the next slide, if we look at the uh, trends for um, underrepresented minorities or um, individuals that are traditionally uh, historically underrepresented in medicine, which um, for this analysis or comparison includes um, Blacks, Hispanics, um, and indigenous groups to the United States. Um, we see in terms of that spread, uh, some similar trends uh, for the most part, but basically kind of the story is the same in that when you look at the total pool of representation, 14% um, for the uh, total graduate medical and education trainees, 
radiation oncology ranks you know toward the bottom there in terms of um, the, the representation, uh, almost half you know um, of that number. Um, and again, when you look at the spread of our colleagues who are doing better, um, you know we can highlight many groups again: general surgery, uh, anesthesia, neurosurgery. Um, and even our, you know, colleagues in diagnostic radiology have made uh, recent improvements. Uh, so again, the, the, it sounds like there or seems like there's room for improvement for us. Um, and in the next slide, if we look at the um, historical trends, this is similar but a little bit different. This was a, 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 now, a recent paper from last year where we looked at the representation of black physicians, specifically in radiation oncology. But this figure looks at multiple different demographics and it actually doesn't look at percentages it looks at absolute numbers so we, you, if you look at that top blue line you can see that the number of radiation oncology residents has increased uh, over time um, and when you look at different demographic groups that that those numbers have increased for both uh, whites um, and women and, and Asians as well but actually the number of um, underrepresented uh, minorities has stayed uh, low and fairly um, consistent and for blacks, uh, black physicians specifically, um, for example, the, the highest numbers were actually seen in the um, 80s and the highest uh, percentage representation was actually seen in the 90s. Um, and so, you know, while we have been increasing the number of radiation oncologists overall, we've not specifically really changed the actual number of um, underrepresented and, and black physicians specifically in radiation oncology. Um, and then, the, so the last slide I have here, and then definitely, sorry for talking so much, uh, <laughs> but uh, just to, um, you know, again, sort of set the stage here. Um, at least the way I sometimes think of this is that there's, there's two overlapping, um, but uh, two issues. One that we often hear about is the pipeline problem that, and that's the bottom of bar, bar there where you look at um, the representation of Blacks, Hispanics, and Indigenous groups in the United States, about 30% um, of the population and increasing, as we know. Um, but when you get into medical school, that number drops in half, um, uh, or around half. And so that's kind of the, what we call the pipeline problem. There's um, a limited pipeline or sort of a leaky pipeline, as people will say, of, of, of students and individuals uh, from these demographic groups that actually go into medical school and graduate from medical school. Uh, but the second issue there is this disparity in representation across specialties, which I've hopefully just highlighted there and that saying with the available pool of uh, women and underrepresented minorities and different demographic groups that do exist, uh, we're not doing as good a job at attracting them into our specialty. So um, I often don't want to miss, you know, this the latter conversation in the broader conversation around the pipeline in general and how we increase these groups coming in into medicine. And so Thank you guys for, for letting me have that introduction. Kurt, without, without making you talk too much, just real briefly, I've always, I think a lot of us think that the pipeline is the issue, but it, it kind of is, is upsetting that we're not doing a great job from our specialty itself. Any thoughts to start off this conversation of why we're not doing a great job in diversity and inclusion? I think, you know, it's a it's a long pathway and I think it's a complicated conversation and there's no easy answers. I think if we had them, you know, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be very easily moving into the solutions. Um, you know, I've thought about it along even in the pathway of just my own experiences and where were the barriers and challenges and ways that I might have, you know, been deterred or not made it to radiation oncology. What were sort of the positives and the negatives? Right. Um, and so I think about and hopefully, you know, we'll probably have some, some good conversations and examples around this, this, um, you know, one, we are a specialty that is not uh, a large specialty and can be right. somewhat obscure. And so um, do people get exposed or have access to the specialty in general um, can be a barrier in itself. Um, whether there are, um, you know, we are inspiring interest in, into the specialty, or are we deterring students, you know, that do get exposed and want to come? Are there things, you know, whether it's the criteria that we've set up or other, you know, uh, the number of research experiences and many other things, you know, the sort of uh, hoops we maybe, you know, to some extent we can say that we have to jump to to kind of get to there. Um, and so along that line, you know, are we adequately caring and mentoring and supporting and networking and creating those networks for people that might be coming from very limited networks um, and backgrounds. Again, it has nothing to do with their capability or competence, but really just the access and the way that we've set up the, the path and the system for, for these individuals. And then lastly, is there you know, bias or 
uh, structural, um, you know, biases that have created again in the system that might be impeding again very highly motivated, competent folks. Again, you know, I, I have, you know, friends that went into orthopedics and gynoc and surgeons, and I, you know, these would be friends that were would be wonderful radiation oncologists. And so that, you know, to me, it's more of an issue of how can we make sure that people have, are exposed to radiation um, and are and are brought along the pathway um, there, and what are we doing as individuals, as institutions, as organizations, as a society, as a specialty, on all of those levels to make sure that we're getting individuals along that path. No, I, I think that um, uh, I will take some kudos. I deserve some credit because my daughter uh, graduated and is, is in radiation oncology. So I, I think that that's, uh, I, I think I deserve some special kudos for that because it is the best specialty in medicine. Shauna, you're now, you're now a season attending at seven days. Um, thoughts about how we can do better? Yeah, I think for the last 20 years overall, we've been, you know, our, we've been a very competitive specialty, which is, I think, limited the work that we've needed to do as far as recruiting students. Um, you know, the, I think the downside of that is that we've ended up with, a, with overall fairly, fairly limited heterogeneity as far as the group of students we've had entering over the years. Um, I think everyone got a little bit too comfortable as far as just letting the sort of the system continue as it was. I think one of the things we need to start doing is more sort of action at our individual program and school level. Um, we can't just expect the students who sort of self-select through ever what, you know, whether it be their home program or what they've been given that they know about radiation oncology and we really need to open up that scope so that everyone is exposed to it they don't need to be at a school that has a big program or you know whether they have a family member that received radiation or you know other connections to the field we really need to open up our scope so that everybody learns about it and that's you know through you know our presentations through our interest groups but i also think it involves us sort of teaching the medical students yes there's no there's no session on just radiation oncology but there's no reason we can't teach a you know an oncology class like we're very educated oncologists um so i really think because when i look back to medical school god we had you know 90 percent of our teachers were emergency medicine and i think 90 percent of my class went into emergency medicine it felt like so there has to be a relationship there with that exposure um, where they learn about you as an educator and then then and they discover radiation oncology through that. And I think those are powerful ways. You know, I think um, before we go to Rachel and some thoughts, I, I think that I am I'm older than you guys and I lived through a time where we weren't very competitive in the early 90s. And I, I think it's a special opportunity to bring people in that might not have four PhDs. Um, that will make great radiation oncologists. So I don't think of this as, I, I think this is a true opportunity to really bring some people in that that might not have had the chance before, but will make phenomenal um, radiation oncologists. And I, I will, I'll echo what you said, Shauna. I, we should be leading oncology. And I had the privilege to, um, to be involved in, in some of the gold medal stuff. And, and Lori Pierce has a great, you know, Lori Pierce, just finished her ASCO presidency. And when I when we talked to her about some of the thoughts she had with ASCO presidency, it was, we need to be leaders in oncology. I fought for us to lead our oncology things in medical school. We are the most trained oncologists. Hope there's no medical oncologists giving me grief now. But we, you know, we have four years of solid tumor training. We are, we are you know, we are leaders. We, we should be prominent in the med school. We should be leading these courses. And I, I think that's really important to, to show that we, um, we have a really vibrant background and it's just such a wonderful specialty, but I'll stop talking. Rachel, what thoughts on how we can do better with this? With this? So I think what, what you've raised and what Shauna has already raised, I think are great points. I think the idea of having people in high profile positions that represent a diverse population um, is very helpful to our specialty. Um, I can imagine that for a medical student who's exploring a specialty, it would be very meaningful as a black medical student to see Lori Pierce as a black woman leading ASCO. Um, and I think that not only from a, um, 
you know, faculty appointment and prominent position standpoint, as mentors, I think that we can have a tremendous impact um, in terms of motivating, encouraging, and just trying to expose people to a field that they might not otherwise have exposure to. I think one of the things that Shauna hit on that I was thinking about as she was talking is this idea of uh, radiation oncology as being such a competitive subspecialty for such a long period of time. I think it actually made us very discerning and somewhat discouraging of mm -hmm. people who didn't fit a particular profile. And I hear from medical students frequently that they're encouraged to take a year off so that they can build their CV. That costs money. They, they, can't, they can't always afford to do a fifth year of medical school. Um, or that they're encouraged to do multiple away rotations. That also costs a lot of money. So if you're a medical student who comes from a background where finances are tight, that might not feel like an option for you. And you might want to pursue a specialty where the barrier to entry is a lot lower. And so I think we do have an opportunity now in seeing that the popularity of radiation oncology has taken a little bit of a dip in terms of applicant numbers to actually look and really be searching for people that we think are going to be great radiation oncologists and do a lot more encouragement and mentorship rather than discernment and discouragement. No, completely agree. Um, I think, you know, I think that um, we, we got a little lazy and, um, you know, if we didn't get our top picks and residencies, we were like, what happened? I, I actually, I actually think it's, um, I know I picked my residency because it was three years, not four years, because I had two kids and need to make money. So I, there's a lot of people in that same boat. Um, Shauna, do you want to talk about some of the, the aero stuff and like um, Rise and Rover and things like that that have been going on? Yeah, this was um, a really big year for Arrow. There was, um, you know, a lot that went on um, with with race that we had so many problems and we really had a very powerful group of residents that stepped up um, and they recognized that we, you know, as a society, you know, as Astro, as Arrow, we really needed to provide a resource for especially our trainees. Um, and that's where the Aero Equity and Inclusion Subcommittee came from. Um, the goal of that committee is to foster a supportive environment for trainees um, comprised of underrepresented in medicine groups. Um, they were there to foster sort of in, in, and facilitate ongoing dialogue. It was a very, very powerful subcommittee um, that was sort of an ad hoc and is now a formal subcommittee. That's one of the, I think, luxuries that we have um, in Aero and on the resident side is we're a little bit more, we're able to facilitate things a little bit faster than some of the sort of larger organizations. Um, this really was a, a wonderful subcommittee that was created. I have to give kudos to, um, there was Ivy Franco, there was Karen Ty, um, Vanetta Williams. Um, they all did a very wonderful job at Austin Sim also in sort of creating this subcommittee. Um, I will say it's probably one of the busiest subcommittees that they have now. It's just over a year old. Um, so they really did a wonderful job. Through that subcommittee, they have, through ARA, we have different mentorship programs as well as through ASTRO. Um, there's another, there's all kinds of great mentorship programs, but I do want to specifically recognize the equity and inclusion subcommittee mentorship program they have, both I think at the both at the medical student level as well as at the resident level to sort of provide those partnerships and those mentorships um, so that people can be successful. And Rachel, your thoughts on some of these programs too? I know you've been involved in all this also. Yeah, so I think there's a number of programs um, that target both medical students um, and residents in terms of mentorship. And I think the, the key aspect of these things is really about advertising them, making sure that people know about them so that they can utilize them. You know, Astro has, and Kurt can probably comment on this, has long had a program to support students who are underrepresented in medicine gain exposure in radiation oncology. Um, and I had a mentee uh, a couple of years ago who participated in that program, and it was actually a feat that he found it. You know, I think that we can do a lot to promote these things just by letting people know about them through SNMA and other medical student associations to um, raise awareness across medical students who are interested in oncology. And I think the, um, the hidden curriculum within medical school is that when people are interested in oncology, they automatically divert into medical oncology or surgical oncology. I think we have an opportunity to actually step in there 
um, and encourage them to learn more about radiation oncology. So there's those kinds of organizations that exist and probably just need a lift in terms of advertising and promoting themselves. Um, and then there's, I think, a, a slew of programs, as Shauna indicated, that have popped up over the last year, rightly in response to all of the things that we're seeing in terms of inequity in healthcare delivery um, and violence against underrepresented minorities across the country, um, where I think that radiation oncologists, like many other people in healthcare, now are paying attention in a way that they haven't before. And so several of these programs, I think, have been very promising, but they're new. So one of them is the RISE program, um, which originated here in the Harvard Radiation Oncology Program um, through Dr. Ivy Franco and other residents who created um, a intern for about a week for uh, medical students who were interested in radiation oncology and who came from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds in medicine um, that they could do virtually because of the COVID pandemic. So we wanted to make sure that these medical students who were interested in radiation oncology, who might not have a radiation oncology program in their home institution, um, and who were limited by away rotations because of COVID, could participate and learn something and gain exposure to radiation oncology. And so in the first year that this was rolled out, we had 14 students who participated in the program, and all of those who um, applied in radiation oncology matched. Um, and I think the faculty and the residents here were really engaged in teaching those residents, and they found that experience to be extremely meaningful. Um, and so that's a program that we're going to continue here. There are other programs that have also been created at other institutions. There's the DICOMS program at WashU, um, again, designed for uh, students who are underrepresented in medicine. That is an on-site rotation, and that actually provides a stipend to those students, which I can imagine could be quite meaningful depending on what their resources may be as medical students. So I think that we're starting to see these new kind of innovative programs come out that are specifically trying to encourage students who are traditionally underrepresented um, to consider radiation oncology. And I think the key piece of this is gonna be how do we sustain it? How do we keep it going? How do we keep people engaged in it? Um, and right now I think we have this great opportunity where people really are paying attention to try to elevate all of these programs and really try to ingrain them into radiation oncology around the country. No, I, I agree. And I think um, Chris and Tom both talked about some uh, having medical students have more time with us in a more consistent basis. I know through some of the work in the ACR, we're really working towards having a, uh, a radiology rotation be more prominent in the, in the third year and us being part of that. I know that, you know, a lot of us forget that we, you know, we have some roots in radiology. I think, I think tying ourselves to, to radiology and getting a, a day or two with us for every medical student would be a really important thing. I, I think we need to have medical students get exposed to us with, I shouldn't say exposure and radiation, get to see us more often. Um, I, I think we would have no problem attracting, attracting people. Um, go ahead, Curtis. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Can I, I just wanted to add, you know, off of what uh, Rachel said, I think one of the, uh, you know, the lessons from the pandemic and being in our virtual world is that we, you know, realize that we can, you know, whilst there were certainly, you know, a lot of negatives and, and devastation, at the same time, there were, you know, hopefully positives that we can extract and taking, you know, leveraging the virtual platforms and opportunities, I think is a huge one. I mean, you can give the example of, um, you know, one of the programs from Astro, we've been over time expanding, you know, the programs housed in the uh, Committee for Health Equity University within, within Chetty. It was the flagship program for Minority Summer Fellowship that you mentioned for mm -hmm. early medical students. Um, and then the newer program, which um, it now completed its uh, second year, was the aspiring, uh, what we call ASP, but the uh, aspiring scientists um, and um, uh, physician scientist program, um, which is an exposure program for undergraduates. Um, and the first year we had it on site at, at Chicago um, uh, and, and work with local university and programs uh, brought in, I think we probably had somewhere around 30 students um, or so on site, which was a great feat and a great program, um, hopefully for everyone that participated. But when we had to switch to virtual um, last year um, and, and switch to a virtual program, um, you know, again, a wonderful program was designed, but we actually had 200 um, uh, undergrad and early medical students, but 200 um, students register and 100 show up uh, on the day, which, you know, we were just thrilled about and, and, and kind of amazed, but really providing, you know, access and exposure to students 
um, and realize that there are a lot of things that we can um, leverage and use in different ways over time, really adapt and evolve that how do we, there are students out there who are interested in can we give them sort of smaller snapshots and, and you know, experiences and interactions with radiation oncologists uh, to help them, you know, to help develop this interest that they might have um, in oncology. And so really excited to see what will come out um, in the future years. No, that's great. A, a topic that's come up a lot, and I, I struggle to know what we should do with that. Any Anybody have any thoughts on the supplement or offer an acceptance program, the SOAP program, um, that has been something that's come up with a lot of our institutions recently? And is that an opportunity, you know, that's been very controversial in our, um, whether we should be participating in it, how we should be participating in it. Um, Shauna, any thoughts on the SOAP program? Yeah, I think one of the biggest concerns we have is that, so there's a lot of discussion as far as um, we've really expanded our residencies over you know the last decade or so. Our spots are significantly higher than they used to be. And there's a lot of concern as far as why were those changes made and do we actually have the workforce or the need for the workforce to sort of fully employ all of those those graduating residents and those those new radiation oncologists. And there's been, you know, what a lot of us perceive as a little bit of a market correction in the sense that medical student interest has decreased over the last, you know, two to three years. And we've seen that in the sense of lower number of applications to radiation oncology, uh, which has resulted in positions not filling. And then we have additional spots in the soap. And it depends on what school of thought you come from, but however, we have a, those spots are nearly filling to a very high percentage. And quite often, those are filling with students that have very limited exposure to radiation oncology. I think one of the concerns is that these students are, are making a major life decision off of very limited information. You know, this is a highly emotional time for them. They obviously applied to some specialty of their choice that they did not get into. And now they see radiation oncology. It looks, it's a fairly attractive specialty, especially when you look in the soap. And so they're applying. That's a big decision they're making. And I think the fear I have and some share with me is that this is really not a fully informed decision. And in a way, some of us may be taking advantage of the sort of vulnerability of some of those medical students because they don't have a spot otherwise. Um, so I think that's just really concerning. And if in fact, we are going to face workforce problems in the possibly near future, you know, that was kind of our one opportunity for natural market correction with like free of antitrust concerns. And we're sort of circumventing that with the soap, which is which is very concerning. Yeah, no, I, I have very mixed feelings on that. Rachel, any thoughts on soap and what if, is an opportunity or should we just be it's a very difficult thing when you're talking about programs. It is. It is controversial and it is challenging because I think all of us are already acknowledging that there are a tremendous number of medical students who'd be great radiation oncologists if they only knew about our field. And so now here we've got these spots available for people who may not have matched in other specialties who may go on to become wonderful radiation oncologists. But I think that there is understandably a little bit of trepidation about acquiring quite so many people without a prior interest in radiation oncology. And I think that is the bigger concern and these issues that Shauna has rightly touched on in terms of market correction, which is, you know, to have a soap, I think a soap makes a lot of sense, but when you've got 25 or 30 percent of your spots going unfilled every year, I think that's sending a greater message about interest in the field um, and demand and whether we should be adjusting the number of spots that we have in response to demand. And again, not an easy thing to think about because it in impacts individual programs to a very significant degree when they decide to decrease or increase the number of spots that they have. Um, but I think it, it does provide us an opportunity as a specialty to reflect on just the sheer number of spots that are going unfilled and what we can do to try to attract people um, with some real interest in radiation oncology. But I don't think, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of, you know, not soaping ever and missing out on some potentially great doctors is the solution either. No, I think I think you're right. We There's been some great comments in the uh, comment section. And one of the things that I'm trying to work on, I think I think would be nice too, is, is having more um, 
oncology electives because a lot of people think they want to go into oncology and making sure we're a vibrant a vibrant part of that. I, I really do think that's important. I also think um, that it's important to, um, Reshma Joxi said, a, has written a lot on this. It's important also to have leaders and especially in academics that are female and underrepresented minorities. We're, we're not doing a great job in that either. So we're talking about recruitment, but I would also recruit people to be um, leaders in our departments and our societies. I think as we have more people that um, can mentor that, that have similar backgrounds, I think that'll help our recruiting. I agree, though I, I caution the idea of overloading people who already are being asked to represent, um, you know, what we know are scarce and diverse backgrounds. Right. Um, because we see so many people who are leaders in the field who are asked to serve on every committee and represent, you know, every group on every organization and also provide mentorship. And I think there has to be some shared responsibility for people who are not underrepresented in radiation oncology to say, you know, this is my responsibility too. I really want to see that diversity improves in the specialty. I want to see more women. I want to see more black and Latino physicians. And so I'm going to really make it part of my mission to, to mentor and to encourage people mm -hmm. who might otherwise not consider the specialty to think about it. Absolutely. Kurt, you've been quiet for a while. Yeah, no, I was just going to add, <laughs> and I'm glad you, you mentioned the, uh, uh, well, I admit I'm, I, I, I'm happy to avoid the SOAP conversation with the program directors and the chair <laughs> address, address that one. But the, um, you know, the issue of uh, mentorship, but, you know, specifically the faculty representation. So you know, I didn't show that specifically like a slide for that, but you know, in the paper on black representation, you know, we showed that in detail, actually the worst, the greatest disparity, you know, proportional disparity proportionally in representation was actually at the faculty level where only 1.5% of, of faculty in radiation oncology are black. And so I think, you know, if we're thinking about uh, what we were talking about in the beginning, even just simply the visibility, the image, having a, a mentor, a sponsor, a teacher, a educator, somebody that, you know, frankly looks like you um, in a role, you know, uh, is, is, uh, can be very meaningful. You know, it can be encouraging along your pathway. Um, and, you know, there's similar trends for other underrepresented um, groups, and as we said, even for women in radiation oncology. And so when we think about why these disparities exist, I think it's important to reflect on what is the status of, you know, the pool of educators that we currently have. And it's going to take, you know, um, everyone from every demographic background to, to acknowledge and support the issue. And so along those lines, you know, I think departments need to reflect on you know how they do hire whether or how they do select their residents but also how they do hire, hire their faculty how do they retain their faculty how do they promote and how do they acknowledge you know what are the pieces along the career pathway um that, that because that is inevitably going to in, influence the pool that we recruit into um, our specialty and you know i think in, in some of the other sessions have been helpful to have you know resources so just want to highlight you know some of these references but we did included in our, our paper and black representation some of these issues of, of bias and burden the minority tax and things that are placed on minority faculty um to um you know try to do so many different things that it, eventually it actually competes with the needs that they have within the department to do their clinic and their research and you know be promoted and do these other things which ultimately might hinder their leadership opportunities and those other things that we're talking about so i think you know, hopefully folks are well, making the connection between all of these, how, how we end up where we are, that these, that these issues um, are, are all related um, in the conversation. Well, I think, you know, I think from leaders in, in medical school and stuff that we've had this conversation before, that this needs to be one of the pipelines for promotion. I think we talk about how important it is, but yet when you write down what you need to get promoted, it's, it's papers and first and last author and I think it's just like we had this conversation 10 years ago about education, that that should be a real a real priority. We should have um, uh, diversity and inclusion have a real pipeline to promotion because it's important. We say it's important, but we have to put it actually take those words into real meaning um, to make it to make it really stick to, to show that this is an important, important thing for medical schools. 
And I think that's one thing I want to say with um, the opportunity that Arrow has provided. We have um, a lot of really great resident leaders that are learning great um, leader. They're having great on-the-job leadership training. They're getting exposure to ASTRO in different committees, and several of them are underrepresented in medicine. So I think we have a really promising um, sort of pipeline of trainees that are um, that are that are going to be graduated in the next couple of years, which I think is very promising. And, and I'll just along those lines, I'll, I'll give a plug for um, another ASTRO program, the Leadership Pipeline uh, Program. I almost said for it was the name change from protege uh, to just leadership uh, pipeline program, I think. But, um, and that was, you know, speaks to this part of the conversation where we're talking about, you know, career development and advancement. It was a way to give access. Um, so it's a program, again, that um, came both in partnership with the board, the Education Council um, leadership um, at the times, uh, Steve Hahn and Lynn Wilson, um, and the Chetty leaderships, uh, Karen Wheatfield, Michael Seiker, and, and myself. Um, to design the this uh, pipeline program that would give access for uh, you know junior uh, not just junior faculty but you know um, uh, individuals radiation oncologists and actually um, uh, physicists even as well but within their first five years I believe it's five to seven mm -hmm. double check uh, we can fact check it later but um, it early in their out of their training um, but give them access and they're partnered with so you apply for the program and one uh, of fellows is um, elected to partner with each council for ASTRO and so they get access directly one you know you get to learn about ASTRO the sort of hierarchy the structure you're getting exposure to leaders um, in the field that can really help um, in this multiple um, multiple ways and so I'd encourage um, people to apply you know for that program and it, it's actually open to it's intensely open to anyone who has an interest in health equity diversity and inclusion has an interest and a track record um, because really, again, we need everybody participating um, um, in this conversation, not just in recruitment, but even broader to health equity. So I know that's a topic for another day, but you know how we make these improvements in our people. Yeah, Rich, I have a specific question for you, I, not to put you on the spot, but we know what ASHRA is doing, but what else can we do as a society? What, if you, do you have any thoughts on what ASHRA can do to help uh, attract med uh, the highest quality medical students from the groups we're thinking about? Yeah, so I think we've touched on a couple of different points throughout the conversation, so I'll highlight those um, and see if I can come up with any other ones on the fly, Bill. But um, <laughs> you know, I think I think one of the things is really trying to make the most of the pipeline we have, understanding that it narrows significantly at the time of medical school, um, and really trying to broaden exposure to oncology and radiation oncology early in the medical school process, whether that's in the preclinical time by teaching medical students during an oncology block um, or during their clinical time and incorporating radiation oncology, perhaps either into an oncology elective or a radiology elective, as I know some programs have done. Um, and then I think it also is about, rightly as we've talked, visibility and having radiation oncologists be very visible in the medical student um, milieu and in mentorship um, and really putting, putting their arm out and encouraging people who might not otherwise think about radiation oncology to pursue it. Um, and I think sometimes when we think about mentorship, we think about it as providing advice and encouragement in a very objective way. But I think that we actually have an opportunity to be very hands-on and to, to open the doors for students and say, no, this specialty really is for you and we would be better off with you in it. Um, and really be very proactive in trying to bring people in, in the door. Um, so, you know, from a medical student perspective, I think the programs we've already talked about um, provide them with some exposure and some stipend um, and potentially a mentor from a formal, um, from a, a national and formal way. But I think each of us as affiliated with medical schools can be doing something similar in a, in a more informal fashion too. No, I think there was a great comment talking about maybe Asher can help us with some content for our medical school lectures and things because I know I did mine based on just what I thought might be interesting. Maybe we can try to put together some things um, in that realm. I, I actually think that's a great idea. The other thing that, that we're doing- I just want to tell you, what there actually is. That was just published recently. Um, so there there is a, a PowerPoint that's on the Astro great. website now. And I think that sort of leads to the point, that's one of the things I think we can do for our medical students as well, for all of us is 
really highlighting the resources that are available. So not yeah. only introducing them to our programs at our individual level, but there's so many great resources out there. You know, like Rover is the new, um, with the virtual radiation oncology lecture series for medical students. And then they have their own virtual rotation. They also have a really wonderful collection of listing of programs that have virtual rotations. And we almost need to, you know, put those all in one place and make sure we're sending students these resources um, so that they have them, whether that be like through listservs, through our medical schools or whatever, but there's a very nice concise little package of, that we could put together, I think, for medical students. And it is wonderful um, that uh, we do have that new PowerPoint that is available. That is, that's fantastic. I, I'm sorry, I feel embarrassed I didn't know that, but thank you for the 500 comments that said we have to develop it. So um, the other thing, I'll give you one thing I'm doing. It's kind of a secret, so don't, don't my physics people get mad at me. We're doing a master's level physics program, and I'm going to push those people to go to med school and come into radiation oncology because they already have a physics background. They're looking for different things to do. You know, I think we got to think out of the box and people that are interested in what we do um, to make great radiation oncologists. I think any opportunity we have to, as, as those of you who will end up um, being chairs or in charge of a department, all you're doing ever, always is recruiting. So um, Rachel, Sean, or Kurt, if you want to come to Chicago, I'm, <laughs> you know, it's a great town. It isn't as bad as it says on the news and I'll do everything I can to promote you. Um, no, I think that, I, I do think that, that we have to be incredible cheerleaders for our field because it is the best field of medicine. And it's a wonderful field. It, we get to touch so many lives. It's a privilege and an honor to take care of cancer patients. And I just don't think people know about us. And I would say, I think I think somebody in the content in the comments said this. My exposure was I went I was going to go into radiology and the chair of radiology who used to be, you know, back before 1974, where it was both therapeutic and diagnostic said, hey, why don't you go in the basement? I, you like to see patients go in the basement and see what they do. And that's how I got interested in the specialty. So I, I do think that if we just expose more um, people to the specialty, it would really be um, exciting. Can I just add, Bill, because I think, and so sometimes what I hear is what, so it's the exposure and, and how and what we expose them to. Right. And I think it's some conversation we were having before, like uh, for a long time, maybe we sat back and we were a little bit lazy just knowing that people are coming at us, you know, applicants are coming at us. But, you know, I would hear a lot of messaging and still do from medical students who say, you know, well, I was told to do medical oncology because I have an interest in health disparities or I have an interest in policy and you know, I can't do that in radiation oncology. And I always ask them, well, who told you that? Yeah, exactly. Was it a radiation yeah. oncologist most of the time? So, you know, really then I'm trying to connect them with individuals who are doing this type of work or spend some time in my clinic or see what we're doing here. We absolutely can play a primary role. And I think it speaks to the conversation around, you know, we need to be out in front and being leaders and not sitting, you know, in the basement or the dark or we need to be out in the community um, and doing all of these things that, um, you know, show the visibility visibility of radiation oncology to show also the you know the students that we can play a primary role be leaders they're leading the oncologists they're primary oncologists and we play that role um and whether it's at an individual level or at, you know at the highest policy levels as well cancer screening cancer disparities we absolutely should be in that conversation and maybe that's why we're not doing as well because we have not been you right. know as, as involved in that conversation um, the other thing I just want to sort of plug, you know, I just want to make sure I get this comment in. I think that, you know, as there are these additional programs and exposure experiences and we are reaching out, I think it's important for, you know, people to uh, understand that, you know, one simple exposure experience is not going to like, you know, automatically guarantee someone's spot, you know, into radiation ecology. And this is what we have. Uh, learned and developed in like in our in the National Minority Summer Fellowship Program, for example, where um, we have basically when we looked at the data about a 60% retention rate, you know, into the specialty, somewhere between 60 and 70%, but 100% match rate. So everyone who is interested in radiation oncology matches. Um, but, you know, that also has to do with what we've tried to set up in that program to ensure that those who are interested actually make it into radiation oncology. And we realized that early on. So not only do they do their eight week summer exposure clinic and research experience, but they have a liaison that's assigned from the committee who's um, 
you know, it's, it's sort of less intimidating than calling them a mentor, but someone who's just can kind of check on them, additional to their own institutional research mentor, but someone who's assigned from the committee is going to check in with them and then can give them that advice, right? Because that's the other piece that hidden curriculum that often doesn't get addressed in these programs. You know, it's not just about uh, exposing them to the specialty, but hey, what, you know, what are the things that you need to do to make sure that if you are interested, we can make sure that you, you get there? Because you know, to me, there, there, there is a piece that seems to be missing sometimes. And if you look at the data, there are applicants, um, there are individuals that are interested in the specialty that aren't making it into radiation oncology. And we don't quite know. I don't. Maybe someone can point and comment where you know if someone assessed that pool well and has some information or survey or data behind that. But you know, who are those individuals? Because that to me is a high yield pool. Those are people that are interested in radiation oncology. Mm -hmm. So what was it? Was it the individual? Or was it just some sort of systemic exclusion and bias that has left them out because they didn't have 100 research papers and experiences or they weren't at an elite institution? So I think we need to have some frank conversation around those aspects as well to make sure that we, again, are not missing those people who are interested in our specialty. We were talking about the silver. Again, there's a pool of people who are interested. How can we really lean into those folks and, and try to figure out how we can get them in if they, they truly are interested? So yeah, that was one thing with, oh, sorry, Rachel, do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead, Sean. Uh, no, I just wanted to say as far as one of the sort of holes that Arrow has tried to fill the last couple of years is that, you know, there's a lot of concern as far as the radiation oncology job market. I certainly can't speak to why we're losing medical students, but I do think from the ones we've spoken to, I think this is a legitimate concern that they have, and I think it's a real concern. Um, to share sort of the survey data we have from the last couple of years, you know, we just we're just wrapping up our 2021 Aero graduating resident survey. We had an 86% response rate this year, and of those 80, you know, of those 163 respondents, 98.2% of them did have a job offer at the time they completed this survey, which was open sort of May to June. Um, and they 91% of them were satisfied and very satisfied, and another 4% were neutral. Um, you know, very similar as far as what we saw in 2020. So I think the graduating resident data remains promising as far as um, people are getting jobs, they are satisfied, there'll be more details sort of about the questions we've asked and the results that we have, but overall things on the graduating resident spectrum appear to be favorable, compensation remains favorable. So all things that I would hope you know, are, would help show those medical students that, no, we are doing well. You know, there's been some com comments that we don't have residencies in historical black college universities. Um, I, I do think that's something we really need to, whether not necessarily opening more residencies, but trying to figure out a way to get exposure in those, in those institutions would make perfect sense to tap that, those institutions. Yeah, so, um, so that's a great point. So thanks to Vanetta and for Ivy for, yeah. for putting that into the chat because when we started RISE, that's exactly what we did. We actually went to all of the colleges that had a large percentage of students who were underrepresented in medicine, including HBCUs, and said, hey, we have this program. Could you please advertise it or promote it with your students? And I think that if there's a way that programs um, that are in proximity to HBCUs or other institutions that have a large minority population in their medical student class can actually partner with them to provide radiation oncology exposure in a formal way. We can, we can again, move the needle, but in a way that is sustaining. So not a one-off, we have this program, please sign up, but we have a partnership with X medical school mm -hmm and we provide radiation oncology rotations because your school doesn't have one, um, and we will guarantee you a spot for a rotation if you're interested in it. So I think that there are ways in which we as a specialty can, can partner with programs that have students that may very well be interested if they only knew about radiation oncology. Um, and I think that also gets to, to Kurt's prior point, which is that I think that one advantage of being a small specialty is that many of us know each other and many mm -hmm. of us know each other in the recruitment process for residents. And I think we have a unique opportunity to be able to very strongly, not just mentor and advocate, but really sponsor some of these students and say, I'm, I really do believe in this student. And I do think that if you accept them into their training, into your training program, that you will be really happy with that decision. And 
I'm vouching for them as a colleague that you know in the field that this is somebody worth investing in. Um, and I think that that goes a long way. We know that that happens anyway in medical school, that people are vouching for each other all the time and we should be investing our reputation and our investment in people that we think are really gonna change the field. Yeah, I will tell you a secret. I'll only hire someone who a friend of mine really likes because it's hard to hire someone you haven't worked with. But if a friend of mine thinks there's a great person, um, I will hire them. So we just have we just have a couple minutes left. Um, you know, any last thoughts, Sean? I'll start with you. No, I think what we've touched on today is there was a lot of tragedy out of the last year or two. Um, but with that tragedy, I think we've had a lot of positive changes that we've been able to to create a lot of great, wonderful programs. That's really up to all of us to really continue to foster, to grow. Um, you know, the virtual world is a very interesting one. We've had a, you know, there's an access issue with radiation oncology and the virtual opportunities, whether it be mentorship, rotations, I think really um, allows us to sort of embrace those students that aren't at our home programs. Um, but in decreasing some of the barriers, I think we have to realize that what we've done for the last 20 years really needs to change. I think there's already been some changes, some great changes, but we need to, to continue to consciously change things and promote equity and so that we can really do a much better job because we all know, you know, uh, the heterogeneity among the group is really, you know, a major aspect of the strength of that group. No, great points. Rachel, any last thoughts? Um, I agree with Shauna. I think um, we're already a very misunderstood specialty amongst doctors in medicine, so we may have to work extra hard to recruit students to radiation oncology. Um, and if we want to recruit diverse students, we have to be extra welcoming. Um, and I think that the events of the past couple of years have finally made people pay attention to that in a way perhaps that we haven't paid as much attention in the past. And so the key, I think, is just going to be how do we sustain that enthusiasm and engagement? And I think the fact that so many people are chatting and providing comments in the chat is actually very uh, reinforcing that we've got a good group of people who are invested. Kurt, any last thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just add to that as well. I think that's where the phase of the accountability, you know, will become more and more important. So again, you know, as, as people are working on their programs and doing their outreach, that they're really looking at the, the outcomes, you know, how successful have you, not just so that you pat your back on, pat yourself on the back because you did a program, but what has been the efficacy? What are you learning from that program? Um, you know, I've talk to many folks at various places, different institutions, and I'll admit even my own, where you know certain programs and I've asked about outcome data and they simply don't have any. Um, and so they don't know what is the true efficacy in our, um, you know, not uh, continuously learning from how we can do better, how we can ensure, again, those individuals who are actually going along the pathway, getting into um, radiation oncology. And if it's, you know, if it doesn't happen to be radiation oncology, that they're they're still going to be good friends and colleagues of radiation oncology because you supported them and nurtured them on their career path and growth. Um, and you know, the, there there are some references of good, strong programs. You know, the nth dimension um, is a, a program in orthopedics is a is a classic example mm -hmm. that published their outcomes and talk about at what is the amount of attention and resource that you truly need to provide to make sure that individuals get to that endpoint and how you can reflect back and look at those experiences. So. You know, I would encourage folks that it's great that people are interested and want to do that. Um, and then if, you, if you're looking for somewhere to go and help, go to Astro's website in the Minority Summer Fellowship. Um, we're always looking for, there's a mentor list where you can list yourself and the students really do look at that. They're at places where they don't have mentors or they're looking for projects and they're looking up people. So you can, you know, just uh, send an email and your, your name would be added there. And students reach out and it's free funding for the students to work for you and get a research project. So. There are definitely ways to get involved and help out this effort. Yeah, no, I have the same thought because I think we really need to need to get more academic in this and tackle it as as a as a cancer that we need to correct and figure out how to correct it. And orthopedics is a great example of, of a group that has really done some great work. So we're coming to the end, and we would like to thank you all for attending this session. The topic of our next session will be on social determinants of health, understanding barriers to overcome obstacles, which will be held on Wednesday, July twentieth from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time. No registration is required and you can find more information on upcoming sessions at astro.org slash This year will be a critical year to ensure we have an impact on the development of more of these sessions. Please ensure you are a member in good standing as we will need as many of you to vote this fall to ensure 
the ex-official counsel for health equity and diversity and inclusion is voted for in the bylaw of revisions to be full, fully formed voting member of the ASHO board. Please check your membership status, be sure to vote and encourage other members to vote for uh, Haiti and as a council. And I, I don't think we have to, we're probably preaching the choir, but please preach to the other choirs. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks for doing this. This was wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Shauna, everybody, Kurt, everybody. Um, uh, Rachel, we really, a fantastic job. Thanks again. Bye guys. Thanks everyone. Thanks.